In part one, we talked about how tough it is for girls to get to go to school in Kenya and some heroes who are making it happen. In this episode, Dr. Kakenya Ntaya describes what she went through just to be a child who got to go to school. Warning, this is not for children, which makes it all the more ironic because the horrific torture Kakenya endured was done to her when she was just a child. Uh, you had to make a decision at one point. You wanted to go to school because it was time for you to not go to school anymore. It was time for you to become a woman. What does that mean in your culture? It means that I have to undergo the rite of passage, which is uh, female genital cutting. Most girls that I went to school with I had already undergone when they were in four, five, sixth grade, and they were already married. I was going to go through the cutting after primary school, after I just finished my primary school examination. And the, I mean, there's no question about you going through it or not, because it's, uh, it's something that we were told, we've seen others growing up, going through this rite of passage. Um, we are told that this is what will make you a woman, and this is what will make you an adult. So you transition from childhood into a woman. And um, having your genitals cut. Yes, it's a very painful practice. Um, we, you know, of course we are children, we don't, we're not told what actually happens to you. Uh, we just know that you get you know, your, your genitals are cut, but you don't know how painful it is. Um, there's no anesthesia. Um, it's, it's made in, it's done in front of the public. I mean, you have people around you. Um, and, you know, it's done with, our time, an old rusty knife. Um, and it's done by a very big woman who just comes and cuts you off. And you can't cry because real women don't cry. And if you cry, it's an shameful thing to your family. So you have to be really brave. Um, and you, you, you are instilled in you since you're young that you cannot cry. And if you cry, you're a very coward woman. And Maasai women are not coward. <laughs> they are brave. Um, it was, um, for me, I was not even thinking about the actual process of being uh, cut when my time came. I was thinking about what happens to me after. Um, it meant that I was going to be married off and deep inside me I wanted to continue with school. I wanted to become a teacher. I had seen the hardship that my mother was going through because being the firstborn meant that I had to help her raise my siblings and I knew that it was a difficult thing. Um, when my dad was present, sometimes he will beat my mother and my mother will go and I will be left to take care of my, sis my sisters and brothers. And I will wake up in the morning, make sure that they eat, make sure that they, you know, it was a difficult job. Mm -hmm. And I knew <clears throat> that um, at the age of 13, I was not ready to bring up my own children, mm. to go out and f look for food to feed my own children. Because I kept telling myself, if I'm just helping my mother, um, how is it going to be when it's just me? And once you're married off, you can't come back to your mother. And you can't, you have, you have to go and build your own home. At age 13? At age 13. Why didn't and, you run away? Um, I think the thing is not, to run away, where would I run to? <laughs> that was the question that you would go, because the entire community, which that's the only thing I knew, um, you know, everybody did it. So where would I go? The other home will be doing it. Mm. Um, so the, the idea for me was not, um, yes, I would love to have run away, but I also wanted to make sure that I go back to school. And the best place for me to go back to school was when I was with my mother, because I didn't know what was out there. So you made a trade. Yes, I, I, I did something that um, I, I walked and talked to my father um, and told him that I needed to go back to school after the cutting, after, after I go through the, 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 the rite of passage. And to him, um, it's something that 
nobody has ever done. Uh, and, and our tradition actually doesn't allow us to, for me to just talk to my dad directly. Um, it is, you can't even talk to your dad? No, you can't talk to him directly. Mm. You know, he can just come and like talk to the kids in general, but if I needed something, I have to tell my mother to tell my dad. Um, that's how our culture was. <laughs> It's changing now, um, but it was, uh, that's how we, you know, dad was, when dad was home, I mean, it was his home and, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden kids would go quiet and, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very, I don't know why we did that and I still always, like, there's not that excited, oh, dad is here, let's go hug him and, you know, let's go say hi to mm -hmm. him. It's like he walks in. And uh, for us, the way we greet, um, you know, our elders is like they touch your head and you just go and you disappear. Um, and it was a very. Um, I feel sorry for your dad in a way because I have enjoyed my children so much. Yeah, but it's it's not, it's a, it's the culture. It's a culture how you know if if you have been taught otherwise. And then you don't really know other, the other side. Mm -hmm. So we, we grew up like that. And I, I did go talk to my father. And, um, you know, I, I think one thing I knew that my dad was um, a learned man. He, he had a job. He, he was very exposed. But there was the dilemma of my uncles. And um, so I had to talk to my dad. And uh, at first he was really taken back and say, you know, why are you saying that? And I said, well, And I this is when go. you were telling your dad you wanted to go to school. Yes. And because of the Maasai culture, he was, he was saying, no, it was time for you to become a woman. Yeah. Go through the rite of passage. Yeah. Which is genital cutting. Yes. He's telling his little girl that. Yes. Because that's what everybody I, I'm sorry. I understand it's your culture. I, I can't see how anyone could hurt their child. I don't think for them it's hurting. I think it's just... They weren't going through it. <laughs> but if it is something that the culture is dictated for many, many years, like people don't know another thing. Like they grew up um, and they have never learned about the effects, the harmful effects of it. They have, mm. you know, they have never even, you know, they, they don't, they just know this is our culture and this is what we do. But it was like, also your you culture know. not to go to school anymore. And you were changing that. Yeah, we were changing How tall that. Was your dad? <laughs> My dad was very tall. Very actually. tall. Yes. And you're this little girl <laughs> looking up. Yes. Breaking um, all the cultural norms mm -hmm. and say, I'm willing to go through this process mm -hmm. so that I can go to school. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about all that deeply. <laughs> Just wanted <laughs> to go to school. <laughs> um, I think and 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 he he did say yes. Um because I actually threatened him and said, if you don't, I'm going to run away. And there is the stigma that comes from having a girl who has not been cut. Um, and that his pride will not be, you know, will be shattered and his name and the name of the family will be tainted. Um, we have a girl in that family who has never been cut. It's a very bad thing in this island. Um, so I, I threatened uh, to, to run away. Uh, and it went to me, I, I was telling my dad that I only need to be in this home three months in a year. Because at that time when I was going to go to high school, I was going to go to a boarding school. And I needed just to be home during the holidays. I told him I never wanted any school fees from him, but I'll work to get my own school fees. Uh, so there was nothing he was going to really lose, except the cows that he was going to get when I get married, uh, which he was still going to get it, <laughs> but just postponing it a little bit. Hmm. Yes. We're going to break away from Kakenya for a few moments to bring in representatives of two organizations who deal with female genital mutilation. Gannon Gillespie is from Tostan, an organization fighting to end this violence upon women. But first, the CEO of IntraHealth, a global organization that trains nurses for the last mile and a native of Senegal, Pop Guy. Clearly, something you're not going to eradicate uh, so simply without looking at all the other social determinants, social factors. And uh, it's, 
it is very clear that unless you spend some time in the social, cultural, religious environment that promote these practices, you ain't going to get far. Um, I like to give the example of Mali, which is a country where I think the prevalence rate of female genital cutting is upward of 90 percent. Oh my gosh. Upward of 90 percent. So what we have found out a few years back uh, when we did our study is that a similar proportion of healthcare workers went through female genital cutting themselves. Mm. And um, so you're dealing with people who have their set of values, who, who were raised uh, with the belief that this is a normal part of life. And so it takes a lot of education and a lot of emphasis on understanding all of these, um, these factors. I don't understand the cultural tradition. Can you help me? I, th I think I can. I think all cultures, and, and I want to preface this by saying that I'm not trying to compare female genital cutting to any other uh, practice, but I think all cultures can have what some of the academics that we work with might call mistaken practices or practices that they're, that they're carrying out and may not realize the full consequence of. Um, and uh, what we found is that actually the, the, the mothers of Africa, who are often very directly involved in this practice, are often carrying out this practice because they love their daughters and because there really is no alternative that they can see. Because the practice, especially when 90% or more of your peers, your family members, it's expected. It's, it's often not questioned, but even if it is questioned, you as an individual can't imagine your daughter having a successful future in not doing this practice. So the minute that you decided not to cut her, everyone would know, and that would begin a process of shaming and name calling and dishonor and disgrace for the family. Now some, it is true, some women, and certainly this was true in, in Tostan's model, there are some women who are willing to take that risk. But it's a very real risk, and it, it's a real risk to the daughter. And so what often happens is that the norm perpetuates itself because everyone thinks, well, I'm not and not me alone, I can't do this. And also no one wants to be the one person standing up at a public meeting saying we have to talk about this thing that's totally taboo and we don't talk about. That's all. So you went through the process? Yes. We're not going to go through the process today. No. We're not going to talk. Yeah. But growing up, I always knew that you know, the inside of, like, something inside me always told me that it's wrong for kids, for young girls to be married when they're young. When they will go get my best friend in high school, in primary school, got married when we were in class six. Um, uh, <laughs> at this point in the interview, Kakenya began crying, and she was angry at herself for crying. But she wasn't sad for herself, as we will see. My best friend was married when we were in class six. Grade six? Yeah, grade six. Oh. So we had been, like yeah, we've been 11 friends. 11 years old? Yeah, we've been friends since, you know, in, you know class, when we were in grade three, and grade four, and grade five, and grade six. And um, it's the only friend like I had. We were playing together, we ate lunch together, we did everything together, and then she gets married. And I come back to school to seventh grade, and I felt alone. Mm. Yet the girls around me, they were all excited that that year, most of them were going to go through the cutting and going to get married. I was sad. Um, so growing up, I knew that that was wrong, even though that everybody around me was excited about it. Um, when I had the opportunity to go to high school, and I was really focused on just staying in school. Even in high school, for some of the girls that were there, from most of them from other communities, they were just dropping out of school. Pregnancy, you know, marriage, and what so each year there is somebody going 
these are young kids. To me, when I got the opportunity to, to come to the U.S. to get my graduate degree, my undergraduate degree, the whole world kind of opened up for me. Um, I had never, of course, I didn't have computer. I didn't know what, you know, searching Google and, you know, I remember my first paper, I hand wrote it in college. Um, and, and when I, the information I learned, I, I just, I became so curious. I remember my English, I did a research paper and the first thing I did was on female genital cutting because I wanted to know what happened to me. And when I learned about all the harmful effects, the things that I was actually feeling and because what happens is like you feel part of you has been taken and you'll never get it back. And you have this void in you and you can't tell anybody about it and you can't cry about it. You just have to silence that voice that's telling you something bad happened to you. And when I learned about it and I became curious about um, girls who get married when they're young, I remember going home for a holiday in December and uh, a neighbor, one of the daughters, was getting married. And when she got married, it was a very difficult thing because everybody was happy about it. But the day of her honeymoon, um, people got listening. And because she was, she was just 10 years old, um, it was hard for the man to perform. And you know, he had to go report to the parents and that nothing happened. And the next day there was supervision and they had to use a horn to actually um, open up the gun. And to me, after I learned all I was learning, um, this girl couldn't go back to her home because she's been given away. Um, in my village, there was no a space for her to go and cry and um, and you know share what she was going through there was no space for that um, the women were telling her ah now you're a woman grow up you know and I got I was so saddened about it and um, so stories and when I go back and I hear you know such and such a daughter has been you know mutilated she's been married off and to me, even sitting here, you know, in the U.S. doing my paper, my brain was just like, what can I do? Um, I needed to stop it. I needed to stop it. Um, You're stopping yes, a culture I needed to from stop doing it. something bad. I needed to stop Hurting it. Hurting people is bad yes. everywhere. Yes, I needed to stop. And that is where I knew the best place to do is to create a place for girls to be girls, for girls to dream, for girls to have laughter and to just be children. Uh, because as soon as girls start walking, she is considered an adult <laughs> by being given responsibility to take care of other children. So you started a girls' school? Yes. I you went on, got your PhD in education, yeah. went back to Kenya, started a girls' school. I started a girls' school, giving hope to girls, um, wanting them to play, um, jump rope, um, and go to school like they should be going to school. Do you look them a sign in the eye and say no more? We're oh, not yeah. Doing this anymore. Oh, yeah. So I'm you not afraid. to go through anybody else uh, anymore? I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Um, we, when we were starting the school, uh, you know, there were sets of things that we had to make sure, like the chief was part of our you know, part of the men were part of what we are doing. You know, we are creating an institution for girls, mm -hmm. and they might have not even conceptualized what that meant. But they were like, "Oh, go ahead and start a school." And the moment we started bringing our girls, I remember um, we started school in two thousand and nine, and the first class we took thirty girls. There were about a hundred girls who wanted to come to the school but I didn't have the resources and I didn't mm -hmm. have the space. And By the way, speaking of resources, we're getting the website up. 
If you feel like that uh, Dr. Kakenya has, is doing something that you want to support, go ahead and do it right now. I strongly encourage you to do it. Sorry, I, I, I don't do that you. during television shows, <laughs> but I'm doing this time. Thank you. Um, and the second year of the first grade, it was fourth grade, and the fifth, now they were in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. One father wanted to cut one of the daughter and marry her off. Yeah? What did you do? So the girl writes a letter to the teacher and said, this is what's happening. This is what my dad is planning. And um, at that time, I was actually still doing my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. And I get a phone call from my teacher telling me, you know what? This girl is going to be mutilated. And I said, it's not happening. So I'm calling the chief, telling them, you must make sure that that girl is protected. And the chief, he said, this is our culture. I said, now, who is the next highest authority? But well, we ended up involving a very high level um, police to rescue the girl. That set precedents in the entire village. No one touches my girls. No one touches anybody who comes close to our program because they know I will go after them. And the girls themselves, are very now they are saying no. So when the girl is saying no, I have the right to protect that child. I have the right to stand in the gap. And when we did that, um, a, a big thing happened. The chief said, because he was going to lose his job, because I went up high in the rank. He's supposed to implement the law, but he wasn't implementing the law. They were afraid of the father of the girl. They said, this is a big man, you know. We don't touch their family. And I said, no, no. Um, so what ended up happening is that now, after the girls have been accepted in our program, every father has and mother have to sign that they will not mutilate their daughters. They have to agree, and if they don't agree, we put them in jail. We tell them what are the consequences. <laughs> Go to jail. In my chair. I, wanted, I wanted to jump up and give you a high five right now. <laughs> no, but it's like, you know, like, I, I think that, you know, when, when you, I got an opportunity, and, and people invested in me. Um, I, I was able to learn, and I had information that I needed to, to give to the people. Now, after we were taking the girls in my school, I realized that there were 70 girls who went back. And I always think about them. And so that enabled me to start another program. It's a training program where we bring these girls who are not in our school to our, week, to our school for a whole week. And we teach them about female genital cutting. We teach them about what are the consequences of early marriages. We teach them about the big thing that's happening is defilements now. And when a girl is raped, she can't report it's her fault. We teach them like um, self-defense skills. And she come to our trainings and the girls are saying, no, no. And the, the parents are, what are you doing to them? And, uh, but for us, we, we want the girls to feel empowered. Um, their children, I mean, these are 12 year olds. These are 11 year olds. We are giving them information that you, you actually are not supposed to be giving to a 12 year old. Talking about what rape is and how to report a rape to a 10 year old. It's not a conversation that I would like to have. But because of the circumstances, the places they are, I am forced to say. I mean, how do I talk about their private parts? But I have to tell them this is what happens when it is when you're told to go through the rite of passage. This is exactly what happened. So and you when, realize you're changing the culture. We're changing the culture. We're taking just the bad parts of the culture. Uh, <laughs> we still encourage the girls to do beading. Uh, we encourage the girls to sing. They love singing. Uh, we, after the trainings, we always do a big celebrations where uh, each year we invite all the fathers, the mothers, and we celebrate the girls. And um, the, the fathers are happy, you know, they are after meat, we slaughter a bull for them and they are happy. So we're, we're just taking bad parts of the culture because I think culture is not supposed to harm, it's supposed to build. Uh, and if you are harming and taking people's dream and destroying their future, that is not a culture, that is something else. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, my people are proud and, you know, we encourage to wear dresses that are red and, you know, we, we, we still maintain our culture, but mm -hmm. um, we, we 
we take the bad mm -hmm. culture out. Everybody out there watching wants me to ask this question, so I'm going to. Do you still talk to your, your dad? Yeah, my dad passed away in 2020, uh, 2001. And uh, I miss him, actually, um, because what happened after um, he got a stroke and he was very healed. And when he was really healed, uh, me and my dad really reconciled and had a very intimate conversations about um, me taking care of my family, being carrying the figure of the family. And I think, you know, in, and I come back to that, every dad wants the best for their children. Sometimes they don't know how to, they, they might not even know how to push forward. When I talk to the fathers of the girls that I have in the schools, they mm -hmm. talk to me about, um, they're afraid that if the girls are not mutilated, they're, you know, they're not cut, they're, they're going to be pregnant. And uh, that is what their worry is, uh, that they become <laughs> uncontained wild girls. And, uh, you know, that's what they are thinking. Um, but we have conversations and we prepare the parents and the girls and, you know, that shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talk to them about, um, they, they say, if my child is not married, she's not going to have a husband. And I tell them, I went to school. Do you like what, who I am now? And they're like, yeah. And then they're like, okay, I think I want my, my girl to have a PhD like you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you have to let her go to school. So it's a, it's a conversation that I, it happens to me. And for me, the better thing that I've been, it's been beneficial because I grew up there. They saw me go to school there. They saw everything I did. They, they saw me come back. They saw me build a school. They saw me give hope to their daughters. They, they saw the whole process, which they have never seen. So they're more hopeful because they have a role model that they're looking up to. At the beginning of the show, I announced to the audience that uh, they were going to meet one of the bravest persons that, that I've ever met. Well, I was wrong. You are the bravest person I've ever met. <laughs> Dr. Kakenya, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sorry. Okay, now high five. <laughs> this interview with Dr. Kakenya and Taya disturbed me greatly. I try to be culturally sensitive, but I'm a father of three with two little girls of my own. I would never let anyone hurt them. How can any father allow what happened to Kakenya and millions of other little girls is beyond me. I fail to see any cultural justification. We don't normally take positions on this show. That is for the guests to do. But in this instance, this violence upon women and girls is merely for male domination. A cold, cruel act meant to maintain control by men over women. It's just pure violence. The men who caused this to happen are so fearful of women that they have to mutilate them. It's pathetic. No human society can stand for it.